Let's do eye disorders first. So it'll be about approximately 30 minutes for each. It's not very long. So first is vision impairment. There are many causes of blindness and there are different levels of blindness. So we can have uh, what they call uh, visually impaired, also known as legally blind. So let's say um, Woodruff reaches to maybe 110 years old and then her eyes fail. Uh, let's say she develops diabetes, hypertension uh, along the way. So therefore her eyes will, her vision will deteriorate. So now she's called legally blind. The focus on the NTLEX is how to take care of patients who have vision impairment, regardless of the level of impairment because they're basically blind. So what do you think our maker made our vision for? What is it really for? Duh, but what's the purpose? So it's to? So you don't? Okay, so it's really for safety. So of course, there's the enjoyment of life, right? So we enjoy uh, things we love. So we have uh, both eyes and ears. That's what Broadway is for, correct? We, we look at uh, our favorite movies, our favorite shows, but the biology-wise, it's really for safety. Okay. So what do you think will be the central focus of nursing care? Safety. safety. Okay. So a few things here. Breast biopia is the, what is this? age-related vision loss. So here, the patient didn't do anything except grow old. So the, the retina deteriorated, the, the optic nerve deteriorated, now you have vision loss. Okay, so we call that presbyopia if it's just related to aging. There are, of course, other causes of vision loss, which we will talk about uh, uh, after this one. So I'm not testing the how many degrees you are. We're not optometrists. So here are the most common causes, which not we'll not talk about all, but most. Number one is macular degeneration. Next, glaucoma. And then cataracts. Those are the only three disorders we will cover for the final exam. Let's go to manage uh, right here. It's all on the blueprint anyway. So macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts. Now, this is uh, as far as blindness. We will, however, cover three, uh, no, two uh, trauma-related uh, disorders, which are the retinal detachment or the retinal tear. Okay, I'll go straight to nursing management. So how do you care for someone? Because do we put them in an institution? No, these people continue to live at home. So our focus is it's going to be a collaborative care. It's not just nursing. It's going to involve occupational therapy, physical therapy, in order to allow them to live at home. Then a social worker will be involved as well as far as helping them find resources or, or be aware of the resources uh, in order to help them function independently at home. Okay, here it is, chart 58-4. So this is how you care or interact with patients with vision impairment. We are at page 1906. Why do you think the author has to say this? Because what do we tend to do when someone has a impairment? Okay. 
what how, how do we treat them okay or do we treat them the same as other people no we treat them differently right so this is something we should really keep in mind that they're not stupid okay they're not they don't have dementia they yeah they just can't see okay let's say for instance how do you talk to someone who's blind regular yeah, they're blind they're not deaf they're not <clears throat> Okay, so no need to raise your voice. Uh, I, again, I won't read all of these for you. Uh, be careful when approaching, though. Uh, announce yourself when you walk uh, into the room uh, because what will happen if you just, especially if you have uh, very silent shoes, you walk in and then yeah, what will the patient, right? St startle them, right? Okay, um, same thing also with a blind dog. Uh, this mm -hmm. happened to me. Uh, about six months ago. So the poor dog was blind. That she, uh, she Karma, her was her name. Karma was probably sixteen years old. Um, no poor thing. She just stays in the room because she has problems going around. Anyway, we so we visited a friend's house and Karma was there. I simply walked over to go to the kitchen and then she got scared and then she of course nipped right. So I was just maybe two inches from being castrated. Two inches away. Okay. Yeah, so it didn't happen. So I just got a bite, but that, that's okay. okay. Uh, using the clock, you know how they use the clock, right? As a reference point for you know where where things are, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Okay. Okay, let's go now to the specific disorders. Any question about nursing care? Okay, so majority of your questions will be, uh, of course, we, we talked about presbyopia and then nursing care, okay, how to communicate and helping the patient function at home. What did you say before? Presbyopia. Since we are the ones teaching the patients how to administer eye medications, now eye medications apply to glaucoma as well as to post-op, uh, post-eye surgery patients. So we need to know how to do it ourselves. Here's a few things to help you remember the teachings and to keep in mind why we do things a certain way, why we wait a certain time between drops and or between medications. So here are the uh, a few facts. Where are the blood vessels really located? Is it on the eyeball or on the conjunctiva? The conjunctiva. On the conjunctiva. There are yes, there are capillaries on the eyeball, but your medication can't really reach it because there is what over the eyeball. There's a lens. Okay, so therefore you see the blood vessel sometimes, but doesn't mean medication can enter that because there is a transparent lens over it so therefore no medications are absorbed in the eyeball it's impossible so all medications will be absorbed in the lower conjunctival sac now why not the upper i mean try putting medications on the upper and under your eyelid it won't stay there so of course our administration site will be the lower conjunctival sac now it has a limited size it can only hold 50 microliters. So this is about the size of a eye drop. So every drop that comes out of the bottle of an eye drop medication is approximately 20 to 35 microliters. So is there enough space for the conjunctival sac? Yes. yes. For how many drops though? One drop only. Because if you put two drops, that's already up to 70. So therefore, if you put two drops consecutively, you're wasting medication. Okay. So here again is the corneal barrier. That's why you don't put the eye drop or the eye ointment on the eyeball because there is a covering over the cornea. Same reason here. And then these are natural reactions. Okay, these are reflexes that we have. You heard about the corneal reflex, correct? So that's part of your cranial nerve assessments when you have patients who are, let's say, 
obtunded or let's say in a deep coma. So you check for the whether or not there is corneal reflex we we'll put in a thin film, right? Or let's say gauze over the eyeball if it stimulates the, the blinking okay? or the tearing. So we have reflexes which automatically, automatically causes tearing, blinking, and drainage. So what will this do when you administer medications? This will facilitate even more wasting of the medication. So therefore, another reason why you don't put two more than one eye drop at a time so you put one eye drop you wait one to two minutes before you put another one now is this a challenge <laughs> yes let's say glaucoma patients in the nursing home they have multiple eye drops some of them will have two or even three eye, uh, eye drops so therefore what's your challenge you have multiple people let's say Dan Su chooses to work in a long-term care facility. She can easily have 20 uh, patients during the day at night shift. It could be all 40 on the unit. And let's say you just have four patients who have who will have to receive eye drops. Both of them or all of them, or each of them having two or more. Can this be a challenge? Challenge? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be tempted to just drop? all medications at a, uh, all at once okay. yes and then the is the patient receiving them no. not at all it's just the same as you squirting the eye drops into the sink all right so this is one challenge and we we have to uh, acknowledge that these facts here are are present okay so therefore you have that's why we have to follow certain guidelines so how do you do it, therefore? So let's say it's time for MedPass. So how would you do it? You have three, let's say, or just two eye drops, and you need to, to give two drops of each one. How are you going to organize your MedPass to be more efficient? Are you going to drop and then wait? Okay, so therefore, you have to coordinate your your oral optic optical i mean ophthalmic or whatever medications okay so that way you're not wasting time uh, it takes a while but you'll you'll figure it out you'll figure out a system so let's review our um, procedure Uh, the medications aren't here yet, so we'll start with the medications. We'll get to the disorder uh, afterwards since they're already here anyway. Uh, which drugs am I testing? Okay. I'll highlight. Sorry, I have to zoom out in order to highlight. So first is atropine. <clears throat> I know these are mediatrics. So for mediatrics, just atropine. I know, sorry, phenylephrine as well. Uh, these are not, so let me put it this way. On the MAR, the patient won't have this on the MAR, atropine, it's mixed with other solutions. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, so these are components of the of the eye drops. Okay, so atropine, for instance, so this is what they are. Okay, so just two for this table. What are other medications we give? We give steroids. You know about a pink eye, right? So with pink eye, we, we do anti-inflammatories. Or let's say after surgery, for instance, patients are also prescribed uh, steroid um, um, eye drops in order to reduce the swelling and the redness. And who uses um, allergy eye, eye drops here? You know, like um, Pataday? Your allergies aren't that bad? A bad? Okay, minus, so I usually use uh, Pataday. Because otherwise, I'll be gouging my eyeballs with a steak knife. Okay, it's that itchy.
Okay, let's go to a few details here. So remember the uh, one of the facts earlier. So what happens when you administer your question? No, no, uh, what happens again when you administer anything onto the eyeball? So there is tearing, yes. blinking, and Blinking. Drainage. Okay, so here, now take note that this is not a one-time event. So for, let's say, glaucoma patients who have to take these medications for life, will these disappear? No. Blurred vision, stinging, burning sensations after administration of the eye drop. This is not going away. This is always present. However, can the patient get used to it? Maybe, but will they ever go away? Oh. No. So this is something you explain to a patient. Now, it's probably okay. I mean, it, 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 your teaching will be successful for an older patient who has, let's say, retired, nothing to do, or, or institutionalized. However, let's change the age of the patient. What if it's a 16-year-old? Because we have younger patients who are prescribed... Uh, who are diagnosed with glaucoma as well. And the only way to keep their vision is to begin treating as soon as diagnosed. Now, tell that to a teenager. Is it cool to, to administer eye drops? No. You know, let's say they're all muscled up and then they do this to administer the eye drop. No. <laughs> is it cool to do that? Okay, so not, right? So therefore, plus... Look at this, the blurred vision that happens after every administration. These are given twice a day for life. We're not saying you scare them about being blind, but it wouldn't hurt, right? I mean, you tell them the facts that if you don't comply, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go blind. Here's safety. This is both for the nurse and the patient. Wash your hands. The tip of the eye drop bottle must never touch anything. If it does, then make sure you disinfect it right away. Okay, you can wipe it with alcohol, let it dry before you cap it. Okay? So because of this, can you let patients share I drop medication. No. no, because you never know that it has touched the the uh, um the the eyelids, okay, especially with the elderly. Okay? They have no, they have poor dexterity, so of course they're going to contaminate the the bottle. Okay, five minute interval between successive administrations allow adequate drug retention and absorption. Now, the five-minute interval is for two different medications. If it's the same medication and you're getting multiple uh, drops, so let's say it's two drops usually, so you wait one minute between drops. If it's two different medications, how long do you wait? Five. five. And the same also for the ointment. Okay, let's go to glaucoma. I showed you last week about the angle okay, on the eye structure. So glaucoma is uh, caused by increased intraocular pressure in the eye. Oh, that's redundant. Increased ocular, intraocular pressure in the eye. Yeah, so, so increased intraocular pressure. So there are two possible causes here. So e remember those those angles I showed you last week? So it's either those canals are obstructed, mechanically obstructed. So let's say there's a swelling or a, um, a trauma to the eye that caused the angle to, to narrow even further. So therefore, what happens to the normal uh, production and drainage of aqueous humor? there's now an imbalance. So therefore, there has to be a constant drainage of aqueous humor equal to the amount that you are producing. So the aqueous humor is, is produced at a constant rate. 
it should also be drained at a constant rate. So if there's an imbalance between them, so let's say you have either an increased production in aqueous humor with the same amount of drainage, will there be an imbalance? Will it result in increased intraocular pressure? Yeah. What about the other way around? Yeah. You have um, the same, let's say the aqueous humor did not change, production did not change, but the drainage slowed down. What happened to intraocular pressure? Increases again. So the prolonged sustained increased intraocular pressure will lead to optic nerve damage and then lead to blindness. Who wears glasses here? Okay, so when you go to your annual eye exam for your new prescription, every whether or not you need new prescription, what does your ophthalmologist also always optometrist always do? What test? What test do they do? Okay, they are okay, they are measuring the intraocular pressure. All right. Okay. So it's now it's now I don't I'm not I'm not sure, but they are measuring intraocular pressure. Oh, okay. Yeah, don't worry, you won't be tested on that because you're the nurse, you're not the optometrist. Yes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's a pressure test. Oh. So the, the measurement of, of IOP is now routine for anybody who are wearing glasses. So when, when you see an optometrist, your part of the exam is free, it's covered. Shouldn't say free because the, <laughs> the insurance. insurance pays for it. It's covered by the insurance. It it always includes uh, IOP measurement because we want to detect, diagnose, and treat glaucoma early. Is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. So here's the eye drop administration in case you forgot or have never really taken the time and thought, oh how how hard could it be? Okay, so here's your. Uh, procedure chart 58 dash 5. Mm -hmm. So, where do you administer lower conjunctival sac? If it's ointment, so let's say you're giving eye drops and ointments, which which one do you give first? Eye, eye drops first. Why? So if you put an ointment, okay, so the eye drop won't be absorbed anymore because remember ointments are oil, right? Yeah, it's a it's a um water resistant, yeah, yeah, impermeable to water because of the petroleum that that material that that is included. So this is it for the ointment. So same spot you. Only 0.25, so quarter to half inch ribbon of the ointment. Now, after the installation of eye drops, what do you do again? Hold the... Okay, so here we call that the punctum. Uh, punctum or um, canthus, right? Inner canthus or the punctum. There's no need to do that if it's an ointment because, of course, the ointment won't run, right? It'll just stay wherever you put it. So here, five minutes if it's two different eye drops, two different eye drop medications, and 10 minutes if it's two different eye ointments. Should there be contact lens when you administer? No. Okay, so just to make sure you know to remove that. So I described the causes of glaucoma. This is again a imbalance between aqueous humor production and or drainage. So therefore either case will result in increased IOP leading to damage to the uh, optic nerve. Here are the risk factors, 58-6. Now, the two, only the two most common. So we have uh, most glaucoma, most common type is chronic, meaning it's not an em uh, emergency. There is a, a medical, a surgical emergency uh, type of glaucoma. 
Let's go to the chronic one. Most common form is chronic. So it's called the silent thief of the night because the patient doesn't have any symptoms at all. When they start having symptoms, then that, that means the patient's already going blind. So the once the patient has symptoms, which are blurred vision now, halos around lights, difficulty focusing, loss of peripheral vision, the peripheral vision is lost first in glaucoma. Then there's aching or discomfort around the eyes. Again, when these appear, has the patient already sustained damage to the optic nerve? So the goal, once that happens, is just to preserve whatever remaining vision the patient has, where that's all the, the therapy can do. Normal IOP is 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, not really, no. Uh, no, you don't have to go into that detail. Okay. So let me just uh, put it this way. So all glaucomas are treated the same way anyway. So we'll just distinguish with the acute emergency is the patient with acute angle, uh, acute narrow, narrow angle glaucoma uh, is a surgical emergency. So that's the important one that you need to teach them. And then, yeah, it's an emergency because the blindness will occur like this right here. So this is the only thing that's different. This is an emergency. What are the, see here, ocular emergency. So the patient will require uh, immediate surgery. Uh, first, they'll put some ointments first, and then the patients will have to undergo um, laser correction in order to open the angle and then restore normal pressure uh, inside the eyeball. So what's the manifestation? So these are the uh, patient's symptoms. Ocular pain, eye pain. There's nausea, vomiting, bradycardia, profuse sweating. And then on examination, the patient will have uh, edematous cornea, of course, the IOP is high, and then pupil is vertically oval, fixed, and semi-dilated, unreactive to light and accommodation. All right? So because we had the symptoms earlier for the chronic glaucoma, so this is now for the acute angle closure glaucoma. Are we clear? So those are the only two sets of signs and symptoms you need to remember for the exam. Any question? Okay. So we already did the <clears throat> administration of eye drops and eye ointment. Let's go now to the drugs. <clears throat> I repeat, the aim of all glaucoma treatment is to prevent Blindness. optic nerve damage. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. yes, which is going to lead to blindness. That's correct. So lifelong therapy is needed. So this means lifelong eye drop administration. Now, don't uh, think that there are all successful uh, surgical options. There's really none. So some surgery may be done to, let's say, in the case of acute angle closure glaucoma, that's an option. But for the other types of glaucoma, it's really to maintain... Uh, normal intraocular pressure, which can only be done with medications. So this is what we mean by the patient loses peripheral vision. So imagine your vision now looking like this. So what will happen to the rest of the of the view? Okay, so let's say there's a there's a lion here. Okay, and then there's a rabid dog here. Can't see. Okay. All right, let's go to the medications now. Oh. 
This is table 58-5. You know what? It's everything. <laughs> the whole thing? <laughs> it's okay. everything. Uh, reason is all of these are in clinical. I mean, you've seen these, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not giving you any BS. These these are all in clinical. I have a contact, but I'm still oh, oh. <laughs> right. I mean, you've given pilocarpine? No. You've given timolol? Yeah. Come on, everybody's got to have at least administered timolol. Mm -hmm. okay. Or brimonidine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Azita Solomide. Uh, you've probably seen the brand name, but not the generic. And then Latanoprost, you've yeah. seen this, right? Uh, this is um Latanoprost is got the brand. anyway. <laughs> so what am I testing here? It's the side effects and the nursing responsibilities. Again, side effects and nursing responsibilities. For instance, let's say here on latanoprost. This is a side effect. Okay, so therefore, um, tell the patient to, okay. Here, azithasolamide, do not administer to patients with sulfa allergies. Okay. So the question should be simple. That you're administering this, what will be your nursing responsibility? What will you teach the patient? How many are these? One, two, three, four, five. Not bad. Five. That's not bad. That's fine. That's not bad. Okay, so surgery is only reserved for who? And for patients who fails pharmacologic treatment, meaning okay. they've been taking the eye drops for decades, but still they have deteriorating, um, uh, deteriorating, or when I say deteriorating, it's the deterioration of the optic nerve and uh, sustained rise in intraocular pressure. Uh, no, the patients, uh, the doctor decides which ones, uh, but as you can see, most of these patients will be taking um, multiple, okay? maybe two or sometimes more than two. Because look at the set. What did we say again are the two most common causes of glaucoma? It's either a increase in production of aqueous humor or a decrease in the drainage. So look at the action of the eye drops. So the eye drops will either decrease production of the aqueous humor or increase drainage by dilating. So let's say in timolol, for instance, beta blockers do what? What are actually beta blockers do besides besides decreasing heart rate? What else do they do? Because they're doing things opposite epinephrine, right? So if, if epinephrine increases heart rate and causes vasoconstriction, what will this drug do? Vasodilation and bradycardia. So that's why it will cause dilation of those smooth muscles in the eyeball. So therefore, it will increase drainage of the aqueous humor. And same thing for the, right here. So brimonidine decreases aqueous humor production. Okay, so this is what I mean by two possible causes. So therefore, the treatment will either target one or the other. Or better, that's why we, we have patients prescribe multiple because they'll do both. We'll, we'll decrease aqueous humor plus increase product, uh, increased drainage. Okay, so that's why. Um, so who decides? It's really the ophthalmologist or the yeah ophthalmologist, um, depending on what does the patient have. Is it the increased production or the decreased drainage? So therefore, they're, they'll be prescribed medication based on their particular cause. What are activities that you remember that increase both intraocular and um, intracranial pressure? Increase 
No, it's a medication that increases the pressure. It's actually not pretty. Okay, let's go to the um, post op. So we're not discussing the surgery, we're discussing and testing the nursing responsibilities. Uh, so pre and post op. So pre and post op, of course, involves some ointments or no, not ointments, but eye drops. So you will be giving eye drops before medicate uh, before the surgery and then uh, after surgery as well. So acetazolamide is a diuretic. So this, therefore, what does this do to the acute humor? Panic. Huh? Okay, because it causes fluid loss, right? And here's your teaching for patients. Now look at the. Oh, no, it's uh, it, it's in the post op. Now, never mind. Okay, here it is now. Yes. Yep. Medication. What It's in the it's in the chart. Uh, column three. Are the side effects? Okay, cataracts. So the surgical option is mentioned in cataracts. Okay, so when you're looking for on the blueprint, when you're looking for pre and post op care for eye surgery, it's in cataracts because the only treatment for cataracts is what? Surgery. surgery. There are no, well, I shouldn't say that. The eye drops here administered for cataracts is not for cataracts, it's post op care. So post op, the patient will be prescribed cataract. I mean eye drops, but it's not for the cataract. It is because the patient underwent surgery. Okay, so it will involve antibiotic eye drops and then anti-inflammatory eye drops. Okay, which has nothing to do with the cataract. Are we clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. So cataract is lens opacity. It can be age related. Most are uh, age related. Here, over eighty years old uh, will have cataracts. Uh, it comes in uh, genetics also. My family has, has cataracts. My mom, my brother, my sister all had cataracts. Uh, we have, have other causes which are trauma, trauma or congenital. So here, so if, if this lens is instead of being clear, it's now opaque. So what happens to your vision? Okay, it's blurred, okay, cloudy. Manifestations. Painless blurry vision. Was there pain in glaucoma? Yeah. Yes. Here there is absolutely no pain. So please read the other manifestations. Uh, there can be double vision here as well as color changes. I mean, imagine, you know, your let's say it's your car windshield. If it if it's opaque, can you see where you're going? Let's go straight to management. No non-surgical treatment is effective. What's the only option? Surgery. Surgery. Okay. surgery isn't as easy to do though, especially if the patient has chronic uh, disorders, let's say diabetes, hypertension. So the doctor has to uh, control those chronic conditions first before performing surgery because our concern is the, really is the healing okay, after surgery. Let's say your sugar is really high. And what happened? What what kind of blood vessels are we talking about when we when we when we're talking about the eye? Are they big or yes, uh, tiny? tiny? Okay. So what happens to tiny circulation if your blood sugar is really high? Or so therefore, what happens to healing after surgery? It decreases. Okay. So therefore, very important to manage chronic conditions first, especially hypertension and diabetes before the surgery is scheduled. Here are other reduction uh, strategies, smoking cessation, weight reduction, again, glucose control, and uh, not mentioned here is uh, control of hypertension. So surgery, we're not talking about the surgical procedure. Let's go to our job, okay, which is pre and post-op care. 
Uh, here are risk factors for cataracts. So besides age, there are other causes here like trauma, toxins. I'm not testing table 58-6. I'll go straight to the pre and post-op care. Okay, pre-op care. So does this involve testing eye drops as well? Okay, and then telling the patient what to expect post-op, uh, especially, especially the the uh, eye drop administration because they're not um, admitted to the hospital. So most cataract surgeries are same day surgeries. It's very rare that they're even kept overnight. So they get this procedure done in the morning, they go home later in the day. So the importance of um, how can you protect the eyeball? Because when you're sleeping, what are you gonna do? Do you have control over your actions when you're asleep? So what will they be wearing? Not even mittens, because a mitten can still rub the eye, right? So there will be a, okay, there will be goggles, okay? Uh, eyeglass, uh, not eyeglasses, but eye goggles, okay, to protect the eyeball. Uh, let's go to the post-op care. It will be mentioned then. So let's go to the uh, medications first. So again, the eye drops here are not for cataract, but rather for the surgical procedure. So the patient will be prescribed antibiotic, anti-inflammatory, and steroid eye drops post-op. So this will probably be one or two weeks uh, prescription. So make sure you teach them how to properly administer eye drops because do the contamination of the tip of the uh, eye bottle here cause complications? Yes, big yes, time can yeah. cause infections. So here are your post-op teachings. Let's go to the activity restrictions. So this applies both for people with intraocular pressure increase or intracranial pressure increase. It's the same because where is your eyeball? It's in your head. Where is your brain? It's in your head. Same. So it's therefore, same Um factors that will increase IOP are the same factors that increase intracranial pressure. So when we go to head trauma next semester, stroke or head injury, the same teachings will apply, okay? So they can't lift weights, drive a car, or engage in contact sports. Uh, here's the eye shield, okay? Especially at night so that you don't accidentally rub the surgical eye because it will be it will be itchy because of all this the swelling the inflammation uh, clean tissue because there will be tearing here clean tissue again wash your hands before you do uh when you do clean it the key here is not to get the surgical eye wet Okay, so this is what this bullet point is saying. When bathing or showering, shampoo hair cautiously or seek assistance. Bless you. Avoid lying on the side of the affected eye the night of the surgery. Uh, they can do light activity. Um, look at the activities that are restricted. No lifting, pushing, or pulling objects heavier than 15 pounds. So can you have sexual activity, sexual intercourse? No. Yeah, no. That's because that's a lot of pushing and pulling. So avoid bending or stooping for an extended period. So can they go down and um and uh, tie their shoelaces? No, because okay. no, of the pressure. <laughs> Again, be careful when climbing or descending stairs. So What's the weight limit? 15 pounds. 15 pounds. No, you can't be here. Come on, children. <laughs> What's everything up here? <laughs> Very mature. <laughs> okay. All right. So describe signs and symptoms of complications. So what do they report? Vision change. Now, this vision change, is this, are we reporting uh, improvement in the vision change? Yeah. Doctor, yeah. I can see. My God, what do I do? 
do we report that? Yeah. So what kind of vision change are they talking about here? Okay, a deterioration. Okay, should it should get better, right? Okay. But tell them also that the full vision improvement is not achieved until all the swelling redness goes down. So it'll be about one to two weeks after surgery, then they'll they'll see the full benefit of the surgery. Okay, not until then. It'll still be uh, blurry, you know, because of the uh, scratchy, scratchy sensations. So report these. Will there be eye pain? Yeah. Of course. Yeah, you just had surgery on your eye. Okay, but not should not be severe pain. It'll just be mild pain. That's that's okay. Will there be some drainage? What type of drainage is normal? What do you think is normal drainage? Yeah. What do you have in the morning? Let's say when you wake up, what do you get there? Yeah, so what color is that? Or white, right? White or yellow. Now, what if it's brown, orange? Is that normal? No. Should we report that now? What about pus? Yeah. yeah. Purely. So as I said, oh, it actually is longer. Vision is stabilized when the eye is completely healed, usually within six to 12 weeks. Okay, but every week it should get better. I'm not doing corneal disorders. Let's go to uh, surgery, corneal surgeries, apply the same thing we just discussed in for cataracts, okay, okay. pre and post op care. This is the same eye. So therefore, okay. the care and for pre and post op will be the same. Okay, uh, the last vision disorders will be retinal disorders. Start with retinal detachment. So this one is usually caused by trauma, whether it's trauma, you know, you hit your head at home, let's say you have a uh, slanted, um, you know, you're on the attic, for instance, you put a bed in the attic, every time you get out of it, you, you chose to put the bed right under the slope. So of course, every time you go up, you hit your head. Okay. <clears throat> so it can be as easy as that. So you may think a bump on the head, ah, this is okay. So it may cause a retinal detachment. It happened to my father-in-law. So he had no idea of the uh, retinal detachment. And he didn't say anything when he had the symptoms. <clears throat> uh, we'll look at the symptoms shortly. So this is the retinal detachment. So the yellow line here are the edges of the retina. That should not be here. It should be right here. See here? It should be attached against the <clears throat> back of the eyeball. It should not be like this, should be resting against the eyeball. <clears throat> so this is now a tear. So when it detaches, so let's say this is my skin. If I peel my skin off um, and, it, and there's acute humor in here and then there are blood vessels here. So what will accumulate here? Blood and acute humor, correct? So can the retina reattach with all those? No. It's just okay, so therefore, can you see very well? No, that's why the as, if this is attached here, then vision would be normal. However, when you detach it, can you still see normally? No, your vision will be <clears throat> uh, distorted. Okay, so let's look at the uh, signs and symptoms. Patient will report a shade or curtain across the vision of one eye, cobwebs, bright flashing lights. And my father-in-law uh, mentioned these, but then he didn't, he didn't see a doctor. He, he just thought, oh, just you know, maybe, <laughs> well, not anymore. It's, it's, it, it's been years. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> too late. So he's legally blind. <clears throat> he still hangs out in, you know, malls watching chicks. <clears throat> <laughs> and in church as well okay so these are the other manifestations are um there's usually no pain but when you when you see these these are never good 
when you see bright flashing lights, okay, so that's usually a uh, surgical uh, uh, surgical matter. Okay, so you call uh, or go to the ER, for instance, and then um, you know, get get treatment right away because we can still fix it at that point, but not after years or months. Treatment is surgery. I won't give the, uh, I won't repeat surgical management pre and post op care. Again, it's the same as with cataracts. Uh, except one thing here, there's one thing that's a bit different. Right here. So, one of the uh, procedures is called vitrectomy. Now, when they do vitrectomy, they use a gas bubble silicone oil or perfluorocarbon into the eyeball. Now, this is gas, oil. This is denser than, than air though. What does air do? Does it rise down or go down or rise up? Gas always rises up. Now, this gas bubble here, which is made of perfluorocarbon, is denser than room air. So unlike room air, this one is denser. So therefore, does it have the ability to push the retina back in place? Yes, so it will rise. So what they'll do is, depending on where the tear is, now the doctor will, doing the surgery, which the doctor knows where he put the gas bubble. So depending on the location of the tear. So if the tear is like this, what do you think will be the position? So we'll put the gas bubble here to put the put gas. Yeah, the, so the gas bubble will push it against this way, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, what head position will the patient assume if it's right there? Like slightly like this so that the gas bubble rises and then does this. So if it's on the left side right here, the tear is here. So where will they put the gas bubble? And then how do you make sure the gas bubble presses on this side? So they'll tilt it here because it always rises up. Okay. So therefore, the important thing after vitrectomy is to make sure the patient understands why they need to do this most of the time. I'm not saying they do this 24-7, okay? Meaning when they sleep, well, most of the time, right? I mean, you have to straighten up. If they give you 10 minutes in a day, yeah, that's what I mean by, you know, you, you have, you know, uh, let's say you have to wipe something. Like you have to keep the air. Not saying like the, uh, the gas. The gas yeah. bubble. Yeah. They have to sit up like this a whole day just sitting up like this. In a chair. In a chair, they want to sleep like this. So what I mean is, let's say you're doing paperwork, right? You're doing number two. You have to do paperwork. You can't do this like that, right? And then see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so do you understand the point? The patient has to follow the, the direction. Okay, so whatever instruction the doctor says, follow it. Any question? Okay, last one. Um, uh, uh, macular degeneration. Okay, so there are two forms of macular degener degeneration. There's a dry and a wet one. What is macular degeneration? Degeneration of the uh, uh, macula. macula. Okay, so macula is the central portion of your retina. The dry type is age-related and which is the most common type. So it's age-related and it's deterioration. What can you do about it? Nothing, I mean, nothing. nothing. So yeah, the only thing you can do is take vitamins. Um, you see in commercials, right? Uh, Bausch & Law makes A-reds. Okay. So A-reds, vitamins, that's all that's prescribed to the patient. And avoid further, you know, toxins or any trauma to your eye. That's all we can do. Any question on dry? Okay, the wet one is not very common. However, this one is treatable. Hey, you can treat this unlike macular degeneration. You can just preserve whatever remaining vision you have. This one is treatable. So what causes the wet type of 
macular degeneration. So this is kind of, I'm not saying it's cancer, but it's kind of like cancer because cancer does what? Oh, cancer, how does a cancer tumor grow? What does it tell the body to do? Form new blood vessels. Okay? They will produce uh, endothelial growth factor and then telling the body, hey, feed me. Give me new blood vessels. I need it. Okay, so they, 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 um, but I'm not saying this is it, but this is kind of the same because this is caused by abnormal proliferation of abnormal blood vessels. Now, these blood vessels are not normal. Obviously, these are abnormal. So these are leaky blood vessels. So therefore, what happens to the blood supply to the macula? Yeah, because these are leaky. These are not normal blood vessels. There is a treatment for that, kind of the same treatment they do for cancer, for this type, for cancers that have this uh, property. So the drug is the wherever that is found here. It should be somewhere here. Okay. Um, do you really need a chart to tell you how to avoid eye, in, eye trauma? No. Okay. Like here. So when you're working with sharp instruments, welding. Okay. Yeah, you know what to do. <laughs> or children, you know, tell them to take a pencil and then... Okay. Right here. In the garden, pesticides... <laughs> no, no. I mean, these are common. Well, I shouldn't assume, right? Because there are pretty. Yeah, like fireworks who are aromaniacs here. Me too. And it was his little brother. He was eight. His little brother was six. And his brother just came in and stabbed him. Yeah, he's six. Oh, he needs to go to the <laughs> Okay, here's the drug used to treat wet AMD. Uh, but there's really no nursing responsibility there. So, I mean, it's just nice to know. Not testing it. There are no side effects or... Okay, so what do these drugs do again? They inhibit the endothelial growth factor. So therefore, they they stop the growth of those abnormal leaky vessels. And then the rest are, of course, you know how to care for patients who have uh, partial or complete blindness and then pre and post-op. Well, there's no surgery involved in um, macular degeneration. That's it. That's it.